Retin Arounds, episode number 146. How to perform scleral depression. We've received a number of requests for a video on how to perform a scleral depressed examination. Today we'll go over some basics as well as tips for success. Our very special guest is none other than the cataract coach, Dr. Uday Devgen, who graciously offered to be the patient for this video. I also want to thank my colleague and star surgeon, Retina Rounds contributor, Dr. Kirk Ho, for videoing the examination. So why does every eye care provider need to know how to perform scleral depression? Well, it's the only way, aside from using a three mirror contact lens, to get visualization of the anterior retina and vitreous base up to and beyond the aura serrata. This is the area where retinal breaks most often occur. And the added benefit of scleral depression is that it allows for a dynamic visualization of the retina. As the depressor is moving anteriorly and posteriorly, oblique viewing of the retina can allow for identification of small breaks that would otherwise be missed. Now, learning how to perform scleral depression takes time and practice, and this video serves to lay the basic groundwork for success. First, you have to choose your instruments. The two most common types of scleral depressors are the shocket double-ended scleral depressor, shown in the bottom left corner, and the thimble-style scleral depressor next to it. Most surgeons use the shocket style depressor, and the end with the wider bar uh, is used most commonly for scleral depressed exams. The choice between the shocket and thimble style is largely based on surgeon preference. I've used both of them and found them to be equally effective. Now, if you don't have a scleral depressor available, another option would be to use a cotton tipped applicator. The downside of the cotton tip is that it is a bit larger and maybe harder to position posteriorly for patients with shallow orbits. Despite the softer tip of the cotton tip, in my experience, most patients find the smaller size of the metal scleral depressor to be more comfortable. You'll also have to choose a lens for indirect ophthalmoscopy. My preference is to start with a 28 diopter lens, which gives an easier peripheral view, although the image is less magnified. If I need to investigate areas in more detail, I'll switch over to the 20 diopter lens, but ultimately the choice of lens is going to be up to surgeon preference. The first step to be successful with scleral depression is communicating with the patient. Often patients who present with acute onset of floaters or other visual symptoms concerning for retinal tear or detachment are very anxious. Your role as a physician is to allay that anxiety. Be calm and patient. I start by explaining to the patient why scleral depression is necessary and I prep them for what to expect. I tell the patients that the light will be bright and they'll need to keep both eyes open to make sure that they're looking in the correct direction. I also tell them that they will feel pressure during the examination, but they shouldn't feel pain. If they feel pain, I ask them to let me know so that I can adjust the amount of pressure, and I also let them know that we can take breaks as needed. I recommend applying topical anesthetic in both eyes, even if you're only depressing one eye, since this will make it easier for the patient to keep both eyes open during the examination. Keeping both eyes open is critical since closure of one eye can result in loss of fixation in the desired gaze direction. You'll want to make sure that the patient is maximally dilated to make the examination easier. Of course, you always want to maintain good hand hygiene and antisepsis of your instruments, and you want to keep the room lighting to the lowest level possible to maximize contrast and decrease glare. A little bit of ambient lighting can be helpful, however, to allow patients to better fixate. The next thing that you'll want to do is to make yourself and your patient comfortable. Adjust the headrest so that the patient's head and neck are supported. Start by examining the patient without scleral depression, since this will give the patient an opportunity to become comfortable with a bright illumination before applying pressure to the globe. When it comes to illumination intensity of the indirect ophthalmoscope, you don't need it to be at the maximum level to begin with. Start at the minimum level that you need to get a good view of the retina. As the patient gets more comfortable, you can slowly increase the intensity. And last, when you're performing scleral depression, don't suddenly push with force on the eye. Rather, slowly increase the amount of pressure. Patients find this far more comfortable. You'll find with practice that you don't need much pressure to get the needed view. Often, novice physicians push too hard to see the depression, and it's because they haven't lined up their view properly, which is a topic that we'll get to in a little bit. If you have everything lined up just right, you'll find that the amount of pressure that you need to apply is really not that much. For the surgeon, keep the chair height at a comfortable working distance. You don't want to hunch over the patient and potentially injure your back. Also, make sure that the patient is maximally reclined, ideally with their head pointing straight up to the ceiling. You want to make sure that your chair is positioned so that there's adequate room to navigate around the patient's head while examining the different quadrants of the eye. 
Okay, let's show you an example here. We're going to start by applying some pr uh, topical preparacane uh, to both eyes. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and recline the patient back slowly and telling them what we're going to be doing at each step of the way. We're going to adjust the headrest and confirm with the patient that they feel comfortable. And then as we recline them back, we want them so that their head is pointed straight up to the ceiling. We do want to raise the chair height to a comfortable height uh, so that we're not hunched over the patient. Now here's an example of the chair being too low and you can see I'm hunched over the patient and over time that's going to cause injury to my back. Now probably the most important thing to take away from this overview of scleral depression is the importance of getting everything lined up. Now what do I mean by that? Well, the patient's gaze, your scleral depressor, and your eyes all have to be lined up in the same direction. And the first two parts are fairly straightforward. If you want to perform scleral depression, for example, in the suprotemporal quadrant, you should position your depressor in the suprotemporal quadrant and have the patient look in the same suprotemporal direction. Where I often see trainees struggle is with the orientation of their eyes. If you draw a line between your two eyes, that line should be pointed in the same direction as your depressor and the patient's gaze. Now let's show you what this looks like. So to begin with, I'm going to be examining the superior quadrant. So I'm going to position my scleral depressor at 12 o'clock. I have uh, the patient looking up at 12 o'clock and look at my head and my, my head tilt and my eyes. If you draw a line between my two eyes, you'll see that it's pointed also at the 12 o'clock clock hour position. Now I'm examining the supranasal quadrant. Again, I've moved my body, I've, t I've moved my head so that again, my, my eyes, if you draw a line between my two eyes, they're also pointed uh, in uh, the supranasal quadrant. And as I'm examining here, you'll notice that uh, examination of the nasal fundus can be a little bit challenging. The three o'clock and nine o'clock positions are a little bit challenging when examining over the eyelid because you are gonna run into uh, the, uh, the medial canthus or the lateral canthus. And so I apply my depressor just above and then again, just below uh, that medial canthus. So here I have the patient tilting his head uh, and I'm going to have him look up and then look down. So he's looking down towards six o'clock. My depressor is at six and look at my two eyes. If you draw a line between my two eyes, you can see that that line is going to be pointed also uh, in the, uh, towards the six o'clock clock hour position. Now I'm uh, ex examining the infrotemporal quadrant. Again, uh, my eyes, if you draw a line between my two eyes, that line is pointed in the same direction as the patient's gaze and, um, and uh, the location of my scleral depressor. Now, if you uh, stand perpendicular so that the, your eyes are pointed uh, exactly 90 degrees away from where the patient's looking, you won't get quite as far of a view out to the, uh, the periphery. And so you may find yourself applying more pressure, more scleral depression than is necessary to get a good view. So here we're taking a look at the uh, nine o'clock clock hour position. I'm depressing there at nine o'clock. Uh, and then my eyes, uh, the, the line between my two eyes is also at the nine o'clock clock hour position. Now I'm gonna have, uh, take a look at the suprotemporal quadrant. So I turn the patient's head over towards me. I have them looking up uh, suprotemporally. My depressor is suprotemporal. And now you can see again, if you look at my, the line between my two eyes, that's also pointed suprotemporally. Okay, so the next topic is how to position the scleral depressor. Now you can place the scleral depressor over the eyelid or directly onto the globe. Now some additional anesthetic is likely going to be necessary if you're placing the depressor on the globe, but for the vast majority of patients, I've performed scleral depression over the eyelids. And this next section shows you how you can position the depressor optimally and most comfortably for the patient. The steps are as follows. First, have the patient look opposite to where you intend to apply the scleral depressor. Then you apply the scleral depressor and then have the patient look in that same direction. As their eyes move, you'll find that the depressor rolls posteriorly in the eyelid crease and it is then ideally positioned to allow for visualization of the vitreous base. As an example here, I want to depress at six o'clock so I have the patient look up at 12. Then I have the patient look down. You can see that the depressor rolls posteriorly so that I can get a good look uh, at the vitreous base and then I can move that depressor in an anterior posterior fashion uh, to get a dynamic view uh, of the peripheral retina. Here's another example. I want to look at 12 o'clock. So at first I have the patient look down. Then as the patient looks up, you can see that that depressor rolls back in the eyelid crease um, and, and rolls posteriorly so that I can have a good visualization uh, of the anterior retina and the, and the vitreous base. 
And here's an example of what that view might look like. So this is taken with the iPhone, so there is a little bit of degradation in the image quality, but you can see that depressor there in the bottom part of the image. You can see the, eleva the elevated bump there of the depressor. That's just about at the level, uh, just posterior to the aura serrata, and you can see the depressor moving uh, posteriorly uh, within the vitreous base, getting a, a good view of the retinal periphery. So again, showing you uh, that one more time, uh, you can see uh, the, the image of the retina, and as the depressor is coming on, at the bottom of the image you can see uh, that bump from the scleral depression. This is going to be right about at the, at the level of the aura, just posterior to the aura, and uh, that depressor is going to roll a little bit more posteriorly now. And normally I'd have a, a little bit more of an anterior view so I could get a better look uh, at the retina proximal to the aura serrata but the view is a little bit limited uh, using the phone camera in this case. How about patients who are having a difficult time fixating? Now often this is going to be because the fellow eye is closed. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Okay, so we want to examine at six o'clock in the left eye. So we're gonna have the patient look up. Now they're gonna look down. We're gonna examine the left eye. Have a look at the right eye. You can see as the right eye closes, the left eye starts to roll up. So let's show you that again patient's looking down, have a look at the right eye, which is open at first, and then as the right eye closes, the left eye, that Bell's reflex kicks in and the, and the eye rolls up. So you always want to encourage patients to keep both eyes open, and if they're having a difficult time, one uh, useful strategy is to have them use their own finger as a target to look at. So you can position their hand wherever you want, uh, they can look at that finger, and not only is the finger a target, but they also have some proprioception that's involved that's gonna allow them to better look in different uh, fields of gaze. So here we're gonna position the patient's finger so that uh, they're looking in the appropriate direction, and then we can go ahead and continue with our examination. Okay, so to wrap things up, scleral depression is a critical skill that all eye care providers need to be comfortable performing. Remember this, along with a three mirror contact lens, are the only ways to view the retina up to the aura serrata. Now don't be fooled by obtaining a fundus photo or performing fundoscopy without scleral depression in patients with acute onset or sudden increase in floaters or flashes. Scleral depression is essential, and if you don't feel comfortable performing this, ex this exam, please refer the patient to a colleague who can. One of the best times to practice scleral depression and to confirm examination findings is to do it just before surgery for those patients who are undergoing general anesthesia. Just make sure uh, that the cornea stays well lubricated while you're examining the patient. I would highly recommend being methodical and consistent when performing scleral depression. Make sure to cover all quadrants of the eye and do it consistently so that you don't miss seeing peripheral pathology. And last, scleral depression takes a lot of practice. Look for opportunities to hone this examination skill and be patient. It takes many reps to get comfortable, but once you get good at scleral depression, you'll be doing your patients a great service. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.